Hey everybody, how's it going? Thanks for joining me this afternoon. I've got a great stream with a great guest that I think you're really going to enjoy. So I'm sure many of you have already seen, but there was an altercation between the police in the UK, an autistic girl. There had been some accusations that she had uh, transgressed some kind of homophobic ordinance by pointing out that one of the police officers looked a little bit like her grandma that was a lesbian. Pretty ridiculous, insane video. We'll get into that and kind of its implications for the wider question of free speech in the West. But joining me today to talk about all that is Harry Robinson. He is a presenter over at the Lotus Eaters. Thanks for joining me, man. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, I was saying just before we started, it's great to meet you finally. We've spoken a few times over message, but this is the first time we're speaking uh, as close to face to face as you can get online. Uh, but it's great to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me on. And to everybody watching from home right now, I, I apologize for my somewhat prim primitive setup. Um, this is generally where the magic happens because at the moment I don't have uh, an, an office space of my own to record from, shall we say. So yes, this is where the magic happens, hamster and all. Yeah, no, I'm definitely happy to have you on. Like you said, we've spoken a number of times. And most importantly, Harry is uh, has excellent music taste. He also appreciates oh, yes. uh, power metal and know, knows that it is the best of all metal. And so I, I've uh, always wanted to say this whenever I watch your streams before, but I really do like the panel's uh, artwork that you've got in the background at the moment. Formation of Damnation, Testament, great album. Absolutely, yeah. No, the, uh, the, the rotating album covers is always fun. I always have people leaving comments in the in the background of the video hey what's what's that one? i got two out of three what's the third one over there so that's a, that's always fun for everybody but all right guys we're gonna go ahead and dive into all that in just a second but before we do let's go ahead and hear from magic spoon hey guys like most of you i have fond memories of waking up at the crack of dawn excited to watch all the saturday morning cartoons mom didn't want to wake up that early on saturday so that meant that we got to pour a bowl of our favorite cereal for breakfast they tasted great, but of course, they're full of sugar, and they're not that healthy, which is why it was a treat. But now Magic Spoon has an alternative to that cereal you love that has zero sugar but still tastes great. There's a bunch of different flavors, but they have a nice variety pack to get you started with cocoa, fruity, frosted, and peanut butter. The variety pack has zero grams of sugar, 13 to 14 grams of protein, and 4 to 5 grams of net carbs per serving, and each serving is only 140 calories. The cereal checks a lot of boxes for people because it's high protein, has zero sugar, it's keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, and soy free. You might be skeptical about sugarless high protein cereal, but I can tell you it actually tastes great. Peanut butter was my personal favorite, but my wife and the little guy were big fans of the fruity flavor. And they both really like cereal, so it's nice to have a no sugar, high protein option. So go to magicspoon.com slash Orin to grab your variety pack and try it today. And be sure to use the promo code ORIN at checkout to save $5 off your first order. Magic Spoon is so confident in their product that it's backed with a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it for any reason, they'll refund your money, no questions asked. Remember, get your next delicious bowl of high-protein cereal at magicspoon.com slash ORIN and use the code ORIN to save $5. All right, guys, so let's go ahead and jump in. I'm just going to show you the video here so you can get an idea of what we're doing. Uh, the, the part that we missed so far is there's about seven <clears throat> police officers, <clears throat> excuse me, about seven police officers approaching the home. They've already entered the home after kind of following uh, this this 16-year-old uh, girl in. But let's go ahead and watch what happens here. Yep, that's what I get for not pre-rolling that video. All there right. we go. <laughs> <laughs> well, as it's preparing, we can go ahead and uh, give a little bit of an outline what happened here. So, Harry, I think a lot of people would be surprised to find oh, out. Oh, oh, hold on. on, here we go. Okay, sorry about that, guys. Here's the video. Oh, it was lying to me. <laughs> uh, uh, the, hor the horrible... Oh, fortune does not picture. smile upon us this It does Eve. not, it does not. All right, so we'll just go ahead and head in here, guys. Uh, so uh, a lot of people would be surprised, I think, to find out that there's some kind of homophobic ordinance going on here with the police of, of uh, what is it, uh, uh, Yorkshire, West Yorkshire, right? West Yorkshire, yes. Not so, Yorkshire, Yorkshire. Yes, sorry. Yes, we'll, we'll get the pronunciation. I need to correct down. you Americans on the pronunciation I, of all these I do plays. appreciate it, yes. Uh, so I think a lot of people would be surprised that there's, there's an ordinance about that. Now, you know, if if it can get this video working at some point, we'll watch the actual footage. But obviously, these police come in, and this 16-year-old girl is sitting in a closet 
Uh, there's a bunch of police officers surrounding here. They're all trying to pull her out. They're trying to arrest her. The mom is saying, my, you know, my daughter is autistic. What are you doing? You know, she, 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 she doesn't know what she was saying. She was, you know, she has a grandma that's a lesbian. She said, you kind of look like her grandma, who is also a lesbian. And all of a sudden, th this is an arrestable offense. What's happening here? Well, it, it is a very distressing video to watch. So in the UK, we have a, a law from 1986, which consolidated a few other laws. A lot of the laws that we exist under in the UK right now, the legislation is consolidation of various other laws that have been put into place over the centuries in some cases, because England's a very, very old country. And this has been the case of a public order offence. This was a law that was put into place in 1986 under Margaret Thatcher. And if I just look here, so it's section four of the Public Order Act in 1986. It makes it an offense for a person to use threatening, abusive or insulting words or behavior that causes or is likely to cause another person harassment, alarm or distress. Now in 2010, I believe it was, um, some year recently, yeah, it was amended in 2010, part 3A of the law was to make it an offense to have any law, that uh, any insult or kind of behavior or anything that could really be inferred as being homophobic, transphobic, all of the different phobias and different uh, speech codes that we have these days that you're not allowed to breach. We've got the line here and that added an extra dimension to the line that you're not allowed to step over. And it's just really sad to see when something like this happens because like you say, when you're watching the video, it's not that the woman is... Right, would rightly, if I, if you ask me, she would be right in saying that this isn't something that should be prosecuted in the first place. What she said was that you look like my lesbian Nana. Now, not only is this girl autistic, to add a little bit of context onto it as well, she's 16 years old and the police were involved in this situation in the first place because she was drunk at a local supermarket or shopping mall for you Americans at shopping center. I believe she was drunk. She was causing some commotion. So they had, uh, the mum thought she was staying over at somebody else's house, one of her friend's houses. So she called the police, they went and picked her up and they brought her back. So reasonably they were doing a decent duty here. This is something that I can support the idea that the police upholding law and order and also preventing young stupid kids from going out and really making it uh, making asses of themselves as young teenagers are wont to do. I mean, 16 years old, we all make stupid decisions. And we, we, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to say that I didn't go out and get drunk a little bit <laughs> when I, when I was a bit too young to do so, but the police go out, they bring her back as they're putting her through the door. She remarks to one police officer that you look like my lesbian Nana. And then this entire situation unfolds. Now, this isn't something that the mum is going, this shouldn't be a law in the first place. This is ridiculous. The mother is pleading, trying to add context to this. Well, she does have a nana who is a lesbian, and you do look a little bit like her. It's, she's autistic. This isn't a situation that should have occurred in the very first place, because reasonably there shouldn't be speech codes like this that penalize it if somebody makes not an insulting comment, not a harassing comment, not an offensive comment, just an, a, an innocent comment, just an observation, a remark. Yeah, there really is that two levels to it, right? Like, first, did she even violate what this ordinance was? Because very obviously, like you said, the comment was innocuous. It's just, you look like someone I know who has this particular trait. Oh, it's also someone who I love. It's someone I'm, I'm related to. So it's not even a insult. It shouldn't even qualify as something that would violate this in the first place. But the second question, I think the deeper one, the one that's probably more shocking to a lot of people, especially in the U.S., is that this law would even exist. And like you said, that this is something that has been attached to law, you know, it's like a culmination of laws that were originally assassinated in the 80s. I feel like we're going to have a lot more to say about kind of how these laws have creeped in over time, both in the U.K. and the U.S., but let's try this one more time in hopes that <laughs> let's see what happens. Let's share this. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> All right. I don't think it's oh, going to work this today, guys. All right. Well, anyway. Uh, so, do, do you want me to just sum it up? Because I watched it for Lotus Yeah, yeah. Why don't you go day. ahead and sum that up for everybody? So they're in what appears to be some kind of uh, terraced house, which if you're in the UK are very small houses. For those of you in the US, the UK already has very small houses in comparison to what you guys are used to at vastly inflated prices because we've decided all of North and Sub-Saharan Africa needs to 
uh, migrate over here. For some reason, I think it's to help GDP go up, although I don't see how. Um, we uh, And it's a very small corridor. The police are all gathered in there, and it all looks really, really cramped. And they have basically bullied their way into this person's home. The, the young girl, once again, 16 years old, autistic and drunk. So reasonably speaking, someone that you would hope that the police would look after and be taken care of as part of their uh, as part of their legal duties is hiding away in a cupboard in the corner, obviously distressed. Her mother's filming the whole thing, screaming at the police, also obviously distressed. While all of these police officers, some of them calmly, but the one who the remark was seemingly directed at, who without wanting to cause a public order offense here, I will say lived up to this girl's description of her. Um, is also in a rather elevated emotional state and is very, very upset. And she's also shouting back at this family. So a complete breakdown of order, a complete breakdown of the duties that the police should be administering. Because at this point, with the UK, um, the jokes that all of the US has against us about, have you got a license for that? Sadly, are absolutely true. We are the land of the license, where if you do not have express written governmental permission to do or say something, then you are breaking some law. We have such a vast labyrinth of legislation in this country that probably stepping outside during a sunny day is probably breaking some law out there. Under Tony Blair, I think it was something ridiculous where in the entirety of his administration, there was something like half a dozen laws passed per day under Tony Blair. So we have an absolute maze to navigate. And what I would like to compare this to, uh, I used to work in a call center. Have you ever worked in a call center? Or I have actually. Yep. Oh, then, then you'll probably know what I'm talking about here. So if you've ever worked in a call center, you're always given all of these little rules and targets that you have to hit, which you pile up to such an extent, there is no physical way that you have enough time in the day to be able to hit every single one of your targets. This isn't necessarily because the targets ensure that you are performing your job to the best of your abilities no what they are instead is because of the fact that middle management types in these businesses are quite vindictive and will try and look for any reason to fire you if you decide to get on their bad side one day and so all of these laws and therefore all of these rules are set up so that they will have a mountain of minor infractions that they can pull from at any time to be able to fire you if they so desire at that particular moment if you've annoyed them. Very similar in the UK. You may not necessarily be breaking any major laws. You may not be going out punching somebody in the face and committing what I would consider to be a real crime, but you will have performed enough minor infractions at any one point that if the police just feel like they want to you know, put the boot to your neck, that they have the permission to. Because what this does, it sends out a message to everybody out there. Because of course, with laws, it doesn't matter exactly necessarily what is written on, on the paper. What matters is who's interpreting it and who's administering it. And we know for a fact that in the UK right now, I would describe it as a very anti-white regime that we're under. I would say the same in the US as well right now. And if you are not a protected class, if you are a native white Englishman, Welshman, Scot, whichever, um, this sends out a message that even if you do anything, if you make any small comment that might even just irritate minorly annoy a police officer they have complete authority to be able to do whatever you want to break into your home and terrorize you and your family um it's it's all very distressing to be perfectly honest because people have an image of the uk in, in in across the world sometimes and i hear this from people even at my own work sometimes that we're the land that birthed the modern conception of liberty we had the magna carta we fought a civil war to dispose of a tyrant King, um, um, yeah, I think Charles the First, uh, the Stuarts. We deposed the Stuarts because they were going to step all over the liberties of the people, and that's not what we live in. England is not a free country, and I don't think it's been a free country for as long as I've been alive. I'm about 27 years old, and I don't remember a time wherein this hasn't been the case in the UK, and it's really sad to see. Yeah, it is very confusing because you know a lot of us looking at the from the United States, we think okay, it's you know the, this. Uh, Bill of Rights, freedom of speech, all these things are from the English tradition, right? You, the, the Bill of Rights in the United States is from the English Bill of Rights, you know, the, the rights enumerated there, um, you know, the, the, these things all flow. And so this should be, this is something that I think Americans just assume is somewhere, you know, kind of inside the English tradition to sustain there. But it, it, we, I mean, we do have a similar uh, 
speech has been somewhat pr more protected in the United States, but we do have a similar crush of bureaucratic law, right? Especially in the United States when it comes to taxes. The old joke is, which is funny because you know we fought a whole war against you guys over taxes, <laughs> so here we are. But the old joke in the United States is, you know, the IRS knows how much you owe them, but they won't tell you. And if you get it wrong, they'll arrest you for not knowing what they already knew, right? <laughs> And and this is and this is the thing is like it, every American is a criminal under kind of the current uh, American tax code, if nothing else. And so it's you know the regime always has a reason to drop the boot on you. It's just well, it's just always withholding. It, it it's an entirely a, an, a, an exercise of kind of their sovereign will as to whether or not they'll actually crush you. Which is why the kind of the rule of law quickly becomes a joke, right? Because oh, look, we're, we're a country of laws, not of men. Well, actually, men enforce these laws. And actually, if you enumerate enough of these laws, everyone's a criminal. And so then the only question is, who is deciding whether or not the law gets applied here? But I did want to read this really quick before we talk a little more about the um, about the uh, freedom of speech issue here. Because uh, in this statement from the, you know, uh, the police here, they basically go on to say, hey, you know, we recognize that uh, some people are concerned. Uh, they, they they may not have liked our tone. Uh, and and the, my main thing, but the thing I love about this is really is like the most thing we want you to know is that this woman or is that this girl won't be charged, right? Oh well, how kind oh, of God. you, right? How how what what, what beneficence for you? Well, to in that case, all is forgiven. Thank <laughs> you guys. I'm so glad that after distressing the family and putting them through a brutal experience, at least she's not going to be punished on top of that. Thank you. Yeah, it reminds me of Tsar Nicholas after like Bloody Sunday. And he's like, the main thing is that uh, I forgive you guys for, for marching <laughs> on me. Like the slaughter of you in the streets, the blood that we're mopping. I mean, I, you know, uh, whatever. But like, I forgive you. Like, it's OK. I mean, you know? I mean if, if I'm completely honest, like talking about, you know, the U.S. with your taxes. Thankfully, that's not something that we're burdened with over here our taxes just immediately get taken we don't have to do all this ridiculous rigmarole where we have to guess exactly what the irs already knows that we owe them uh, but when it comes to going back to the other rebellion the civil war in, in england i'm getting more and more convinced by the day that we would have just been better under left under the stuarts because i don't think they would have let this happen to us it really, I mean, it really is amazing. So yeah, let, let's get in a little bit to this free speech tradition then, right? So in the US, obviously, this is this is uh, supposed to be, supposed to be uh, instantiated in the First Amendment. It's supposed to be one of the core five freedoms of the First Amendment, along with religion, assembly, press, uh, you know, petitioning the government. All of these things are, are uh, supposed to be protected by the First Amendment. I, I'm one of the the foremost proponents of saying that the constitution is not doing a great job of this but there is at least i think that that it does echo a more serious tradition of it in the united states where um you know you, even though if it's not being held to the same standard now there is still a wider understanding of this freedom in the uk it feels like that's been gone for a long time like you said this is something that 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 is a law that is built off of things that were passed in the 80s. A lot of people, uh, you know, talk about wokeness and how it's this American export. But if the British were already censoring this kind of speech back under Margaret Thatcher, I mean, is this more of a universe? Is this an Anglo thing? Is this a, a Western thing? Like, what What is happening here? How, what happened? Well, I, I will say that I think that when people look back on those defining moments of British liberty, that they do uh, put them on somewhat of a rose tinted, they put on their rose tinted goggles when they look back at them, because all of these freedoms and liberties that have been afforded to the English people have always come with some requirements on the side. So when you go back to the 1688 Bill of Rights that we got after the Glorious Revolution, it still said all of these rights are for Englishmen, but not Catholics. Not Catholics, because the Stuarts were Catholics. We don't like Catholics anymore because they're subservient to the Pope and King Henry VIII got rid of that all for us. The Tudors sorted all that out for us. So we're not going to allow these, extend these same rights uh, to, the, uh, to the Tudors. There's always some kind of exception, and it's whoever is determining that exception. In the US, you guys have your constitution, and I've recently been really enjoying reading De Maestra. Who, who's an, an excellent read, if you ever get the chance, if you're watching this and you haven't read him. Um, but I'm very much on his side when it comes to the idea of a constitution, which is just having a piece of paper saying, we are a nation now, 
does not make you a nation. A nation comes from something much deeper than that, a much uh, thicker idea of identity. You need to have some kind of bonds going back generations and generations that ties you both um, uh, ethnically and, and to the soil as well. Uh, but I think that has actually proven somewhat of a weakness in the UK, because as much as the constitution over where you are isn't doing the most amazing job at defending all of your freedoms, it is still somewhat more robust for the purposes at the moment than the unwritten constitution that we have in the UK. Because all it all it showed with Tony Blair when he came in and started to just completely upend the social fra- fabric of the UK was that it just takes the wrong person to come in and go, well, the constitution's unwritten. So there's a kind of vibe, there's a guideline of how this country should be governed and what aims it should be governed for, but we can still just completely upend that. Margaret Thatcher was part of the initial upending of that. The public order is quite ironic, actually. If you know anything about British history, in the 1980s, there was this huge, huge thing about the fact that the Tories under Thatcher wanted to implement something called Section 28. This is very controversial now because you have lots of leftist activists going back and using this as some kind of linchpin to, uh, to show everybody that Britain is an institutionally homophobic country and always has been. Because what it was, was that it was going to prevent schools from teaching uh, gay stuff, basically. And, you know, in the long run, I'm sure you understand this in America as well. Uh, maybe we should have done a better job of actually passing that through. Because <laughs> uh, it turns out that they might have been right in doing that. Because um, the slope but- was a little slippery there, yeah. It, it was just a tad slippery, but under Margaret Thatcher, who wanted to do that, they put in the public order in 1986, and ironically, under that same legislation that she got passed through, they've now turned that around to make it so that anything that could remotely be interpreted as homophobic is illegal. Because, once again, there is no real free speech in the UK. We have this kind of idea of freedom of speech where you go back to the tradition of somebody like John Locke, who was talking about the freedom of speech that was necessary. But once again, even he had exceptions and requirements when he was talking about freedom of speech, all of these different liberal values. Somebody pointed out to him, but if we allow all of this, won't it allow space for subversives to come in and subvert the social order like atheists? Yeah. His qualification his qualification for this was, well, we'll just make atheism illegal then. This, is, this has always been the English frame of mind, which is uh, we'll have all of these principles up to where common sense says maybe we should have a boundary there. But now where common sense in our elites is, is so far removed because it's under this managerial frame of mind from anything that you or I or even your average working man on the street would consider to be common sense. And it leads to laws like the very, very infamous, and this is a big one for freedom of speech in the UK, the Communications Act 2003. Are you aware of this one? Uh, I I believe I've heard of it, but go ahead and refresh my memory. You will be very familiar with this for one particular story because it was Section 127 of the Communications Act 2003 that turned Count Dankula into the star that he yes, is today. Yes, yes. Because that's the law that he was prosecuted under when he posted his original Nazi Pug video online. So that one, if I just read from the description that I have up here for you, uh, it makes it illegal to send malicious communication using social media that's made a criminal offence. It was declared an offence to persistently make use of a public electronic communications network for the purpose of causing annoyance, inconvenience, or needless anxiety. Now, this clause was put in there initially because of the fact that they wanted to reduce the number of silent telephone calls that people were receiving, because, as you'd imagine, it's not pleasant to go and answer your phone and find that somebody's just breathing down the line at you. So it kind of has somewhat of a noble intention, but then gets malformed later down the line to make it so that, well, we can interpret this as if you're saying nasty things on social media, well, then you're doing repeated annoying and uh, inconvenient and causing needless anxiety. And Section 127, the one that uh, Dank was prosecuted under, uh, made it an offence to send a message that is grossly offensive or of an indecent, obscene or menacing character over a public electronic communications network. And once again, that may have come with the greatest of intentions, with the best of intentions. I can't read Blair or his cabinet or his MPs' minds from the time, but this is how it's been used since then. All right, I want to ask Harry another question about what this means about the growth of government and power. Are these things inevitable? But before we do that, guys, let's uh, check in from another sponsor when it comes to free speech. If you're a person of faith, you'll love this. 
the Supreme Court recently overturned a 50-year-old legal precedent that permitted open hostility to public expression of faith. To get the word out, this calls for more public expressions of faith. The overturning precedent was cited when high school coach Joe Kennedy was fired from his job. His crime? Praying in public after games. It took seven years of court battles to get the precedent overturned and his job back. To celebrate, the people over at First Liberty Institute created the First Freedom Challenge. They want people to fill local stadiums and pray after the game, just like Coach Kennedy on his first game back Friday, September 1st. So what can you do to promote the First Freedom Challenge? One, sign up at rfia.org and commit to praying on September 1st. Two, record a short video message challenging people to take a knee in prayer with Coach Kennedy. And three, share your video on social media. It's been decades since Americans enjoyed this level of freedom, so let's express our faith. Join me and take the First Freedom Challenge. Sign up at rfia.org. That's rfia.org. All right. So, Harry, as we've you know kind of run into multiple times, you've said multiple times, well, they, they passed this law with the best of intentions. It was supposed to give us one thing and the other. It's supposed to ban one thing. It got flipped over. That's and, for and being charitable, it. but yeah, carry right. on. <laughs> right. But, but so so we've we've kind of run into this uh, multiple times now. Obviously, in America, uh, the right kind of learned this lesson. I think a little bit with the Patriot Act uh, and the, the way it turns out that eventually uh, the war on terror is the war on you. Uh, but I think uh, you know a lot of people then ask this question, and this is kind of the libertarian to this, right? Is government power is then just bad, right? If if this if this is a consistent problem, the government acquires this technology or this power, this new provision. Uh, then kind of the key is just to restrict government, shrink government at all, at all times. And then that way you don't have to worry about kind of a government accruing power. So is this simply a function of government accruing power? Or is this something else? I don't consider myself a libertarian. I used to, but I don't anymore. So I'm not going to turn around and say that this is just a function of the government, that everything the government ever does turns terrible, I'm going to say it's much more specific to the character of the elites and the governing class that we have in power at the moment. If used well, the government can be a force for good. The state can be used to uh, orient the masses and the public in a direction that's beneficial for everybody. I recently got done reading a book by Evola, uh, where he's discussing fascism viewed from his traditional perspective. And he had a very interesting way of summing up what the um, what the state should be for. And it kind of lines up a little bit with Hopper's idea of monarchy, ironically, given the two I, would, I imagine would have disagreed a, a lot on a lot of things. Right. Yeah. But I, I, I agree that used properly, government power can be a force for good. But our elites don't want to use it for a force for good outside of benefiting the nebulous idea of the universal man, the liberal idea of the universal man who is a simple economic unit who can be moved about like a pawn on a chessboard into whatever area of the market is most necessary for him to be in at that particular time. And at the expense of um, the aging demographics that we have here in the West, um, and you know they're not going to do anything that will benefit family formation over here, uh, so it's going to continue aging in their estimations if they see the trend lines, if they look at it through the purely rationalistic managerial view of let's see what the graphs and the stats have to say. Well, they're not going to do anything to try and improve that. The demographics are going to keep aging. So what they're going to do is they're going to keep importing foreigners over here. Well, if you import foreigners over here, you're going to have divisions that, co that come up because of that. And that's one of the reasons that a particular organization called Prevent was started because we have a lot of Islamic migration over to the UK. I don't know. Uh, you know Callum, one of my colleagues. I'm familiar, yeah. Uh, did, did you watch? He has his own YouTube channel where he uh, posts documentaries. He did a video the other day that was really excellent. I'd recommend everybody to watch it called Tourism in Merry Old England. So in 2021, we had the government census. And what this did, you know, it was a census. It took down information from everybody regarding where they live, uh, their demographic information, including their ethnicity and their religion. And when they eventually got round to releasing this information, because they definitely did not want to release it at first, because for those worried about demographic replacement in the UK, <laughs> it wasn't going to quell their, their fears. But they released a map online that you can access that will tell you the ethnic breakup of various parts of the country, the entire country. And you can go down to neighborhood level on this. 
And if you zoom in, you can find parts of the UK that are just completely 0.0% white English. So no British people live there whatsoever. And there are parts of Tower Hamlets in London. And there's also a town in, we've been speaking about West Yorkshire, there's a town in West Yorkshire called Savile Town, which is 0.0% English. So he traveled from there to there and then went to one of the few places in the country that's still 100% white English. And, you know, we, we have, uh, uh, those areas were very Islamic. Prevent as an organization was originally started to prevent Islamic terrorism. It didn't do a particularly good job of that. The UK had a number of very, very high profile Islamic terror attacks going all the way up until 2017 when we had the MEN Manchester Arena bombings at the Ariana Grande concert, which is actually, it's quite close home to me because I had a friend who was attending those concerts at the time who was there, who managed to get out, but she had to take years mm. of therapy to be able to get over what happened there. Um, what Prevent has done instead in more recent years has reorientated what they are doing. So they're no longer exclusively focusing on Islamic terrorism, but they're doing something very similar to what the FBI is doing in the, U in the US, which is focusing on homegrown domestic terrorism, that being far right white supremacists, meaning basically anybody in the UK who disagrees with demographic replacement and the absolute travesty of what is being do done to our country at the moment. It gets to the point where you see all of this constantly being done against the citizens of the UK. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm on the list, <laughs> if, if I'm honest. Once again, it, it doesn't take much to break a law in the UK. And I also put, go on a public platform, put my face out there, put my name out there. So I wouldn't be surprised if people are watching me. People are probably watching Callum. That's We live in a surveillance state in the UK, and it's abs absolutely dreadful. Well, you know, what, one of the things that I think kind of brings all that together, what you're talking about there is, you know, originally you're saying, well, John Locke just assumed that people would have common sense, right? Like they, they, they just have common sense. But how, how can sense be common if you don't have a shared tradition, if you don't have a shared culture, folk ways, under religion, understandings of core basic values? You can't have the, this basic thing like, okay, we can grant people liberty because there'll be this general sense of what's right and wrong, what's shared, what, where our values are, where the boundaries are. And, you know, the, the society will police these things. Yeah. We, we won't be able to liberty, but obviously we understand atheism is dangerous. So like, you know, we'll, <laughs> we'll just, but you know, but it's seriously that that's a, that it doesn't really transgress. I just talked about this a little bit. I did a, a video yesterday about rule of law. It doesn't really transgress because all of the laws that are on the books in that scenario where you share that culture and that understanding are ones that hew closely to kind of natural law. They're all things that you would naturally have in place if your community wanted to pursue, pursue virtue. But when you don't have that shared background, when you don't have that shared understanding and moral vision, then you end up having these, you, you need general legislation to bind all of these disparate factions together. And so that's how, you know, we, we've seen these videos in the UK where people are getting arrested for thinking prayers in their head outside of abortion clinics. I mean, this is a country that was essential in the spread of Christendom. And now they're imprisoning people because they might be thinking the wrong thoughts outside of an abortion clinic. That, that that only occurs because you have this general blanket uh, idea of the universal man instead of the specific culture of this is how we are. This is how we understand our freedoms and liberties inside our, you know, inside our country. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not a big fan of John Locke being, <laughs> being that I'm, I'm not, I'm not a liberal. I don't subscribe to the idea of the universal man, but even when he was describing this idea of the universal man out of the state of nature, once again, he had these exceptions they would bring into it. And I think one thing that we always need to take into account is that when people in the 1600s, the original liberal philosophers were talking about the idea of this man, they weren't actually being quite as universal as it, we take it as being now. They were really talking about well-born European or Englishmen. That's, what they, that, that's who they were talking about. In the same way that you look back at Aristotle and he talks about democracy, and uh, the need for uh, and certain elements of uh, democracy being good because it allows the people to be able to make their own decisions. Well, in the ancient Greek conception of democracy, the people was a very set a few citizens, a few thousand people in an overall polis, which was mostly made up of people who weren't citizens. 
So you still had this idea of a, a closed community of people who were intelligent enough and uh, refined enough to be able to make the decisions. But as we get further and further and further away from that, that's when these ideas become more and more abstracted and you have to refer more to this general idea of common sense. And I think England would still be a country with common sense had we not opened the floodgates up, and, uh, up to all of these new communities who've come in here since the late 1990s when Tony Blair opened the floodgates. Because even in 1997, when he was elected in, England was still about, I think, 95.7% white English. Uh, going back to the 1950s, when supposedly we originally opened up the floodgates in the Windrush generation to rebuild the country, because now we still have, we have, sadly, a cohort of um, based immigrant, uh, based people from immigrant background who have uh, who appear regularly on television shows like GB News, who associate themselves with our Conservative Party, who will turn around and out of, as far as I can tell, pure ethnic self-interest, say, even though they're supposed to be based, well, England would have been nothing without the uh, immigrants who came and rebuilt this country after World War II. Well, I'm sorry to break this to those people, but back throughout the 1950s, we were still 99.8% white English. So it was the English, shockingly enough, who rebuilt England. But since then, social discohesion, everything else that's come with that. You've spoken to Morgoth recently, so I'm sure you're well aware of the Rochdale grooming gang scandals and a lot of the other things that have come with the import of foreign populations who do not share our values and are actively hostile to us are. But once again, it's the fact that the government goes along with this and actively makes it more difficult for the host, well, the native population to be able to speak about this. Um, when, when Morgoth was on, did he mention the Equality Act to you? Uh, no, but I am, I am somewhat familiar. Yes. So we basically imported the Civil Rights Act o over into the UK in 2010. It was the dying gasp of new labor under Gordon Brown after, in 2007, Tony Blair had left. They decided to pass through the Equalities Act, which was something they'd had in their 2005 manifesto pledge. Um, the Tories have been in power for 13 plus years at this point. They've still done nothing to repeal it. They've done nothing to push back on it. In fact, they've only strengthened it. So the Equality Act of 2010, it puts in um, protected classes in the same way that the Civil Rights Act of 1964 over in the US over there, uh, you have your protected classes um, uh, under that as well. But this goes on uh, it goes to race, it goes to gender, to gender transition. This was something that was originally there in 2010 as well, so they were already protecting the transition classes. It also talks about sexual orientation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it does very similar things to the Civil Rights Act. It makes it so that you are unable to legally discriminate against these people, and it also makes it so that if I just get the information that I've got up here, it has a clause, section 149, which introduced a public sector equality duty, which obliged public bodies and tacitly as well businesses to encourage persons who share a relevant protected characteristic to participate in public life or in any other activity in which participation by such persons is disproportionately low. Now I've looked over the guidance, and what this means is that they basically have to put in quotas. <laughs> yeah, and it's, you, it's congratulations you guys have a uh, disparate impact you have your own uh, yes uh, duke, duke power yeah I, I looked at the guidance earlier it's absolutely hilarious how they get around not calling it positive discrimination they call it positive action and they say that the oath they say the way the reason we know that it's not positive discrimination because of course we still believe that discrimination is a bad thing even when it's done against native English people. They say, well, we don't want you to put quotas in because quotas, they would be discriminatory. But if you have targets, if you have targets, then that's absolutely fine, which it's the same thing. It's, yeah. it's so, the exact same thing. Somewhere Orwell is uh, is generating electricity spinning in the grave. Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. He is. So so I, I guess the, the question is then, you know, uh, I, I know it's bad in America when it comes to the right. Obviously, a lot of people have noticed that the GOP is not the best protector of, of American freedom and, and, uh, and barely putting up a fight in many ways. But over in in the UK, it feels like the right, in theory, the Tories, the conservatives are actually driving a lot of this, like in, in ways that, you know, the, the GOP are locking in the gains of the left in America. But in the UK, it feels like the right leaning party is driving 
m much of this change in your country? Oh, yeah. The Tories that we have right now are far more radical than any political party that I can think of outside of fringe communist parties who would never get into power in the first place. What's most damaging about the Tory party, uh, which is the name we have for the Conservatives over here in the UK, is that they are the longest lasting political party who's ever existed. As far as I can tell, they have outlived any other political party you can think of. They stretch back hundreds of years and they are also the most successful and they act as fantastic containment for the right, for the actual right. Any right that might actually burst out has, as far as I can tell in the UK, if you want to go out and do official action, is completely cornered. Because if you come out and you say actual right-wing things, then you will immediately get prosecuted under the law. Tommy Robinson with the EDF, he wasn't even official, an official party. He was just a grassroots organization of, if I'm perfectly honest, a bunch of football louts who wanted to prevent gang rapes and other such things from happening in their hometown. He, got, he gets prosecuted under the law a number of times. Even if he's not actually broken a law, well, they'll find something that he may have done somewhere that we can charge him for anyway. If you are an opposing party, um, the Conservatives will try to redirect the energy that a party like UKIP had under Brexit and will then transfer that energy to themselves. Because in 2019, Boris Johnson, the leader of the Conservative Party at that point, uh, campaigned under the promise that he was going to get Brexit done. Technically, he did. But under his Brexit, we did not become a more local Britain. We became a more global Britain. And since his party came into power, what happened was under Tony Blair, when they opened the floodgates, yes, we got massive influx of immigration that we never had before. But most of it was still EU migration. It was coming from Eastern Europe and particularly Poland. My hometown of Crewe has a large Polish population as a result of that. And it's still bad because they're, <laughs> to, sound, to sound like a, a character from Hot Fuzz, they're not from here. They're not from round here, they're not. Um, but being European, they still have a culture that's close enough that it's easier for them to not necessarily assimilate, but coexist with the native population. Since Boris Johnson came in, we had visa restrictions lifted. I forget the exact type of visa, but I think before it was a limit of 20,000 visas granted per year to non-EU citizens. That was just lifted. That was lifted since Boris Johnson came in. So we've had more, a gigantic influx of foreign migrants from mainly North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa coming since then, alongside the illegal migrants that we get coming over on the boats on the channel. So that's not great, but it happened under the Conservatives. So the Conservatives took that energy that UKIP built up, where people voted for Brexit because we want to have control of our borders, we want sovereignty, we don't want to have the EU lording over us and telling us what we can and can't do. And they turned that into a leftist cause, is, is what they did, is what they always do, every single time. Every single radical thing <laughs> that has happened in this country has been administered by the Tories ever since Labour left. And they make things that were administered under and legislated under the new Labour regime, they make them worse. So for instance, the Communications Act, obviously, they were prosecuted, that was prosecuted by the SNP in Scotland, because it still goes over there. Um, but what the Communications Act did was it created a new regulatory body for all online communications and all, well, sorry, all media communications called Ofcom. I have worked for public radio stations in the past that have been administered by Ofcom. They are a complete ball ache to work with, as you'd imagine, with anything that's just red tape after red tape after red tape. But for instance, in the UK, we have GB News, who are like our equivalent of Fox News, but <laughs> somehow worse. Um, and as part of their Ofcom regulations, if you are having a political debate on something, you can't just have one person come on and give their side of the story. You have to have the opposing side as well. So if you ever tune into GB News, you'll find whenever they're talking about anything political, oftentimes my colleague Connor will come on and give the right wing view. And they will also have some random, sometimes actual communist. I think Connor is appearing maybe tomorrow or some a uh, few days after uh, on GB News soon with a man called Aaron Bastani, who runs a literally communist news organization in the UK called Navarra Media. So you have to have what's uh, the idea of um, balance. 
between the opposing viewpoints because you don't want to overwhelm the public with some idea that this is the only way to go. You have to show that balance. What the government is trying to do at the moment under the Tories is introduce the online safety bill. What that would do is, one, the original wording of the legislation made it so that it would outlaw legal but harmful speech. So <laughs> All that would literally that they don't like, yeah. That yeah, just great. speech they don't like. And right. if you call it legal but harmful, you have therefore made it illegal. So the calling it legal in the first place is a complete moot point. But it would also put all online uh, communications, which would include me under the Lotus Eaters and even probably what we're doing right now, under the remit of Ofcom regulation, which would mean that Lotus Eaters, as it exists right now, would not be allowed to exist. We would probably have to move to America so that we can enjoy some of your freedom. Although I did just find out that Wyoming only has a population of 500,000 people and is bigger than England. So God, imagine the wide open spaces. We just don't get that over here. Yeah, um, they, they might notice you guys over there though. You might stand out a bit. We, not we not might, from around here. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, I suppose that would be the same problem, wouldn't it? But we would essentially have to be some kind of free speech refugees. Because yeah. what we would need to do to make up for it is on every show, because every show we do is discussing political matters, we would have to have someone there who can provide the opposing viewpoint, which would destroy the entire format of the show and is obviously just another way of trying to demolish any kind of free speech that we have that could build right-wing momentum and energy. And outside of all of the sneaky legislation they do, we've just seen with Nigel Farage recently, if they just don't like what you're doing, they'll just take your bank away. So <laughs> I don't like sounding like a doomer because I do think that there are lots of cracks of weakness in the regime at the moment. It, it won't last forever. Um, and one day there will come a day when we will win. I, I honestly and truly believe that. But as it stands right now, because of the legal maze that we find ourselves in, I don't see a... Straight, I don't. I don't see a, day, a direct route to victory. I don't even see a direct route for a party to be able to emerge that would be able to provide any kind of wins for us. I mean, once again, if you want, not in the UK but in Europe, AFD in Germany right now, they go, Germany's going full liberal democracy and just yeah, deciding just to ban. Bring that up, yeah. They're just going to ban their opposing parties. It's well, it's ridiculous. Yeah, well, then let me go ahead and frame that question for you then before we go to the, the, the questions of the audience real quick. So, uh, yeah, the last thing I wanted to ask you was obviously, you know, we, we the freedoms of liberal democracy, right? We've got to we've got to oh, we've yes. got to lecture Putin and all these other world leaders because they're the authoritarians and we're the West and we believe in democracy, though it's it's always under threat. It seems like seems like the existence of opposition is just this amazing threat to democracy, which makes you wonder what democracy means. But we have all these Western liberal democracies that are suddenly very interested in banning any kind of opposition. Like you said, Germany getting rid of parties that are becoming too popular there because that's how democracy works. If there's a popular party, you, you just ban it and then you win the election. So I'm Hussein Sal, right? 99% for me. You know, I just killed all there my votes. It's amazing. Uh, you know, in America, obviously... We, we had a better you know record on this for the most part, but now it seems like we're speed running, catching up with everybody here because now they're you know, indicted, indicted Donald Trump for the fourth time. Uh, this time, Donald Trump is accused of very dangerous behavior, like quoting the Constitution. Um, I'm not not joking here. These are things. I've not things, looked into the, most in the indictment. impeachment. He, is that he, it? He's quoted the Constitution. He asked oh people God. to watch a news program. Uh, he uh, he conferred with lawyers, which is definitely not a Sixth Amendment right under the Constitution. You can't just go read specifically that right directly. But but these are all things that Donald Trump is now accused of uh, in his latest indictment. It's very clear that the push, you know, we, we've jailed, you know, it's, I, I remember that, uh, you know, Carl Benjamin, he would debate with the academic agent. And he would say, oh, you know, I know you hate liberalism, but liberalism is not that bad. You know, you're doing your show, right? You're not in the gulag. It's like, well, that that time feels like it's fast, fast approaching us, right? Like we're we're in the situation where uh, any political opposition, guys like Douglas Mackey in America are you know convicted of making memes, uh, could face 10 years in jail here at this point. It feels like all of these Western liberal democracies are simultaneously moving towards, uh, you know, kind of this uh, 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 making it illegal to have any kind of opposition. 
how long, and it sounds like you're saying, you know, these cracks are showing, but how long can this fantasy of freedom under, you know, <laughs> under Western hegemony continue to survive the actual actions of these Western governments? Well, I mean, I, I can't really say for sure, because uh, everything that I've been looking into recently shows that, once again, the cracks are showing. Everybody can see what's happening. All that needs to happen for the cracks to just fully explode and for the whole system to call crum come crumbling down would be for some kind of organized political opposition, because we both know that you can't just have the populist mass of the people rise up and take back the power. That's not how these things work. You need some kind of organized group who are able to organize the masses and affect real change in that way. But the regime is showing more and more that it's just happy to stop acting the fox and play a little bit more of the lion. These, these are still very pathetic people who are in charge of these countries right now. Honestly, I would respect them more if they did just start breaking out the guillotines, but they don't because they are cowards. They are moral cowards at the end of the day, but they've shown that they have built up this gigantic facade around them of all of these laws that give them any reason at any time to be able to arrest you and outlaw your existence and outlaw your beliefs as well. So, as long as that still happens, as long as they still have the will to actually effectively combat their opposition in such a way where they just make it illegal for you to oppose them, I can't say for certain how long it can last. But I can say for certain that I don't think it can last for that much longer because that because it's so transparent is why there are other elite groups beginning to rise up instead and reveal to the population at large that this is what's going on. People don't believe in liberal democracy anymore. Liberal democracy has been sold to people as a beautiful system where you get a say in what your country does and the policies that your country puts forward and what you're governed by. But it's become clearer and clearer in recent years that what Sam Francis said about liberalism is true. It's not a system. It's not a system that allows you to affect meaningful reform. It is a set of beliefs that are preferred by our current elites, and they want to keep it that way, and they don't want anybody who isn't already one of them to be part of their party. They don't want anybody else who can come and affect it so that their preferences aren't always the, the ones being given primacy. So I don't know how long it can last, but I don't think it could last uh, maybe, uh, maybe more than... Uh, my grandchildren's lifetime. Well, <laughs> maybe, I'm being a bit, maybe I'm being a bit long on the time scale there, but I still, as it stands right now, I don't see a way out of this if we're not allowed to orga uh, organize effective opposition. I think you're right that it's not eternal, but it is a multi-generational project. Yeah. And uh, it, it doesn't get started if you don't start it now. So that that's very important. All right, guys, before we go ahead and pivot over to the questions of the people, Harry, where should people look for your great work? Oh, uh, well, you should go over to lotuseaters.com. You, you can find me on there. I do a regular monthly series with my colleague Connor where we indulge in our naughty, nerdy autism and we talk about comic books. We also do book clubs like uh, for many different styles of books. I think one that we're going to be doing soon is looking at the um, book that Nora Vincent wrote where she dressed as a man for a year so she could get the idea of what it's like to be a man and realize it's not as rosy as lots of feminists <laughs> Seems to think it is. Yeah. It turns out when everybody on the street sees you as a piece of dirt to be stepped on, life isn't quite as easy as you might expect it to be. Um, and we also do a daily podcast that you can find on YouTube on the podcast Lotus Eaters. Along with me, you can find, as I mentioned, my colleague Connor there, uh, my great colleague Stelios, who does great work on philosophy. Carl Benjamin, Sargon of Akkad, I'm sure many of your viewers will be very familiar with. He does regular content there as well. So it's a really great website, and uh, we offer subscriptions for all the premium stuff for as little as £5 a month. So well worth the investment, if you ask me. Yeah, you guys need to keep the, the 40K think pieces coming. That's where it is. That's, that's, that's <laughs> There's only been one so about. far, but I know right. that Carl's got at least uh, another dozen. Yeah, just, just make ready sure we, to go. Yeah, make sure that the, the all the demand is filed. Okay, I know it's there. I know the audience is there. Everybody's looking for it. All right, it so a lot of views. <laughs> it's just, absolutely, man. Uh, all right, so David Sar here for five dollars. Cheers, bruv, bruvs, uh, the, the plural. Uh, glad to see this crossover finally happen. Well, thank you, man. We definitely appreciate thank it. You.
uh, Alyosha for a hundred dollars. Thank Oof. you very much, sir. Very much appreciate it, and very generous of you. Uh, and yes, we will continue to kick all of the butts. Thank you very much. Um, yes. Yeah, <laughs> I wish you had a larger question there. I feel like we should we should be go going in depth on on that one. And if he wants you. to give us a hundred dollars just sure. for keeping on kicking ass, well, I say you take it. Thank we'll you continue. Very much. We'll continue. All right, uh, Super Joe's midlife crisis, ten dollars, <laughs> or until Harry to get a makeup girl. Yeah, guys. So I mean, if you're not like. It's always weird to me because, like, I just have the home studio, which is why I'm, I'm like, shiny here. But then, like, I go into the blaze and they're hitting you with makeup, you know, brushes and everything. Oh, and, we don't have makeup. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very surreal. But, but it, it does keep you from being shiny. So, uh, I okay. Just because a lot of people have pointed this out recently. It's worse since we moved into the new studio. I yeah. think it's because we've got new studio. You got better lights. lights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've got better light, so I just should look shinier on it. Right now, <laughs> it's because before I came on this, I had a pretty heavy gym session. So, um that's why i'm i'm sorry i don't have a professional he, setup i don't he, have a brick wall i do have i do have artwork i've got dragon ball z artwork so that's the best i can do yeah until i see blind Gu guardian background i'm you know it's it's not enough i need to, <sighs> I need to see improvement. oh man, I'm, I'm so tempted to start just posting <laughs> covers guitar covers of blind guardian i've been going through a big dimu ball gear phase as well at the moment so god I don't want to get onto that because we could probably go for hours. <laughs> we'll, we'll set up another episode there. Uh, Tex Mex oh, yeah. for $5. Looks like just a thank you. Appreciate it, man. Oh, no, there's another hit one here with a uh, question. Thank you, sir. Uh, Oren, have you heard of Carlism? It's a traditional Catholic and Spanish counter revolutionary movement from the 1800s. Uh, there's a chapter in Texas. Yeah, I'm pretty sure they were one of the factions in the Spanish Civil War, uh, along with the Phalangists and, yes, and others, yes, I believe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not super familiar with the specifics of the tradition, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of it as, as a historical event. Um, actually I'm going to have Panama hat, uh, uh, for those who are familiar, he'll be on Thursday and we'll be discussing the, uh, the causes of the Spanish civil war. So if you'd like oh, to wonderful. learn more about that, uh, then I think you'll probably get, it will probably touch on, uh, multiple factions. M many people don't know that the right and left were made up of many different factions. There, uh, a lot going on in the Spanish civil war. So we'll be diving deeper into that. So we might Just hear more on plug. that. Yes, I, I, I did a uh, Bo, my colleague has a series called epochs where we talk about history. Uh, the only episode I've appeared on so far, I was talking about the S Spanish Civil War with him. And it was very, very informative. So please check that out as well. And definitely tune in to see Panama hat because I, I know Panama He's an absolutely wonderful chap. Nice. So we'll have a one two punch of, uh, of Spanish Civil War history there, guys, if you want to check both of those out. All right, everybody, I think we have hit all of the super chats there. I want to thank everybody for coming by. Uh, Harry, uh, despite our, our, our multiple uh, technological failures, I think we managed to put together uh, quite a, a good uh, show. Everybody seemed to enjoy it. Thank you very much for coming on by. It's been uh, coming on, man. It's been a pleasure. Well, thank you again for inviting me on. Hopefully we can do this again sometime and talk Absolutely. about something a little bit more cheerful. Absolutely. We'll, we'll do our best. We'll find something. We'll, <laughs> yeah, we'll find power metal. We'll do the power metal episode. Uh, that's yes. it's the most cheerful of all metals so it yeah we, we can it is the most based as well it, absolutely yes 100 percent. all right guys if this is your first time here of course please make sure that you go ahead and subscribe to the channel and if you'd like to get these broadcasts as podcasts make sure that you listen to the orrin mcintyre show on your favorite podcast platform when you do that if you just leave a rating or review that really helps with everything thanks for coming by guys and as always i'll talk to you next time